And welcome here, everyone, tonight at the new art gallery in Walsall. Can you all hear me? That's wonderful. Um, those of you who have lived through the past year and a half are used to seeing people on a the screen these days framed by a Zoom frame or a Teams frame or a Google Meet frame. Uh, but it's a real pleasure to be here in a physical art gallery talking to people in person with an audience in front of us. But what's even better is that we're surrounded by pictures. The pictures you all came to see here, uh, the work of Anne Smith, who we're going to have this Q&A with tonight. And it's a great pleasure to talk to Ange. It always is. And I look forward to the next 40 minutes or so. Um, Ange, um, welcome. First of all, you know this space very well. You know the work around us very well. And when I was walking through this space earlier today, and it's a really beautiful space, your, your, your work looks really good in here, um, I was just struck by the, what I call the painterliness of it. You are a real painter, and it can only be painting. That is your medium, in a strange way. I don't know if that makes sense. Why, why was it painting? Was it always painting? Yeah, it has always been painting, actually. I mean, I did a year at Central St. Martin's where we tried everything, and I did some welding. <laughs> I made some big sculptures, but no, painting... There's something about painting that really speaks to me and I think it's the same thing that speaks to a lot of people and I'm so glad that you started with that question I was thinking about what how I was thinking about a way to describe how big an impact painting has had in my life really I mean I've spent the last 25 years devoted to painting and I was thinking back to a time when I read in the newspaper that um, the El Greco exhibition at the Prado, I think we're going back like 2007, was opening. Anyway, I just read in the paper, it was the penultimate day, and I was in London, and I just decided, right, I'm just going to go and do it in a day. So I just, pre-COVID days, pre-Brexit days, it was super easy just to, just to do that. And I remember arriving at the Prado, and being in the queue, and not feeling very, not feeling very well, but I've been, I've been working quite hard in the studio, and I often work nights, all night, just to get things done. So I just put it down to that. And I finally got in to see the El Greco paintings, which are breathtaking. Um, and I felt quite overwhelmed by that experience, but I was obviously quite ill as well. <laughs> so it was in front of the Annunciation. I just went down like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> and I just fainted in the space, um, which was mortifying. And I remember seeing, there was another member of the public there, just her horror, like not concerned, she was just horrified. But you know, that, Im that image of myself doing that really stuck in my mind because actually, I don't think that was a ridiculous reaction to that exhibition. It felt quite appropriate actually, because I think when a painting speaks to you, it almost deserves that reaction. I just, it's such, um, such a huge passion of mine and it appeals it appeals on so many different levels I think when I first started out there was um, I used to get asked questions um, for example are you the feminist artist are you the eco warrior are you interrogating art histories and I used to get asked for a particular hook or a particular way into the work not so much now and you know, the thing I love about painting is that my work can be all of those things in one moment, and then in another painting, none of those things. And what I love about the medium is that it can facilitate so many different conversations at once. Um, so that's another thing, just linguistically, I love painting for, for that as well. And, you know, painting also affords like an oblique way in. I love that Emily Dickinson poem, like, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. And I, I love the fact that painting can afford, it doesn't have to be literal. It, it can reveal itself slowly in layers and different encounters. And I guess, lastly, the reason that it's painting for me is just the sheer pleasure of making. Just affords me a satisfaction and a gratification that is very hard to really quantify. 
at the moment, I'm making a painting in the studio that has lots of animal forms in, which is something that you can see that I often engage with. And I can't think of another medium which could afford that kind of flexibility where you can paint, you know, every tiny hair in a, a stoat's tail or something. Um, and really enable like a deep dive into the mysteries of nature and the animal kingdoms. I just can't think of another way that I could articulate that. Um, I know that Nabokov, who's one of my favourite writers, writes about nature um, and he speaks about it having non-utilitarian delights. And it's that aspect of nature that I'm engaging with currently in the studio, just that almost uncanny otherworldliness that it seems to point to. And uh, yeah, I just can't think of any other way that I could articulate that than in the medium of paint. It has to be painting. It has to be painting. I think El Greco, by the way, would have been very pleased with that reaction. <laughs> I think that was exactly what he's, <laughs> he and his patrons were aiming to do. Yeah. And, and it, it makes sense to me, especially visiting the Prado or an institution like that, where you're just surrounded by so many great masterpieces. Yeah. You, you already hinted at that, that painting for you at least, the finished painting can, can really make you slow down, can mm -hmm. stop you in your tracks and really can ask for that attention, that, that longer period of looking. It can invite deep looking in a way. Uh, in you making these pictures, is there also a moment of slowing down? How does slowing down come into making these works? Yeah, so I have... Um quite a frenetic home life, like I'm sure lots of us have. And I walk to the studio from my home in the mornings. But once I'm there, I tend to, I have a pre-painting ritual, which I won't go into, but part of that involves just sitting in silence for 21 minutes, and I just sit. And I'm starting to cultivate a sort of meditation practice. And the reason I do that is actually purely practical, and it's just a way of changing from one headspace into another headspace, a headspace that enables me to think much in a completely different register, actually. Um, but I think you're so right. The act of looking and the act of taking time for the deep dive and not just thinking, okay, that's what, that's what that piece of work is about, that's what that piece of work is about, but actually asking questions and following threads and... Um, <sighs> perhaps finding that there might not be an immediate answer um, or that there's, there's a mystery there to be unravelled or perhaps revisited on several different occasions might reveal different aspects to a painting. I think it's so important that we cultivate the act of looking and that we slow down um, because I think it has actually, it has sort of real world consequences. You know, if we don't, if we don't look, then I think perhaps we lose the ability to question information that we are receiving. And I, I sort of feel as though, you know, I'm a great fan of, of Instagram and social media, for example, but I think that kind of instinct where we just expect to receive shallow bits of information that's constantly refreshed. And I think that can be quite dangerous in a sense because I think we need to turn things over carefully in our minds and always ask where is this information coming from and what agenda might be behind that. I think in real terms, in social terms, like that's actually an important skill to develop this critical thinking and this capacity. So I actually think that's not why I'm a painter, but I do think that is a social function of art that is really valuable. And I think, yeah, the act of contemplation and slowing down is, is really useful, actually, practically. Yeah. And perhaps uh, painting, as you do it, is the antidote to the fleeting, to the soundbite. It's painting as a long read, yes. something that really has to capture your attention. And maybe for a moment even allows you to step outside the hustle and bustle of the everyday, of the fleeting moment, and really take time, which is a very rare and quite luxurious thing these days. Yeah, absolutely. It is so luxurious. I mean, it's been fascinating to hear back Post, I mean, artists always talk about this, like, you know, exactly what we're speaking about, but these public spaces are so important in terms of providing that sort of solace and that escapism even, you know, just that space where exactly as you say, you get a bit of a respite. And, you know, I do think of my work as very conceptually rigorous, 
but, and, you know, I have an academic approach, but at the same time, I like to think of them as, as gardens as well. I mean, I love to just to wander into the national and just get lost in a painting for the sheer pleasure of looking about. And maybe just for that, just for that 20 minutes that I might be in there looking at this work, you know, it just affords you a bit of relief from the constant, you know, things that we all think about the whole time. It's very restorative, actually. We've been talking about painting in a quite an animated way as something that seems very much alive. And yet, at the same time, critics and writers in the last 150 years or so have really pronounced painting dead many yeah. times. People have talked about the end of painting. It's no longer a medium with a future. How do you look at that, what I would call a slightly tired discussion? Yeah. Yes, it does. That, that thing does come back every few years. I mean, I associate that discussion initially rearing its head with the onset of photography in the 1830s or whenever it was, yeah. um, which did change painting for sure. And then with Duchamp and the ready-made, that changed painting in the 60s with Donald Judd. You know, we had that, in a sense, painting did die those deaths, but it always seems to revive. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm perfectly comfortable well, actually, I'm more than comfortable with this because I feel as though painting has always, traditionally, been able to look at itself and reinvent itself and interrogate itself and then move on and progress into the next iteration of what it becomes. And I just think it's so... Now, culturally, we're in such an important moment when we're looking at our histories as Europeans. And, you know, a lot of that's hugely problematic... And I just think what could be more apt as a medium than painting that is so baggage ridden and there's so much that's problematic in the history of painting. So to make painting now, it feels like the perfect medium with which to address that. And that is very much something that my practice takes on. Yeah. And talking about life and death, but maybe also the weight of history that's, that's behind painting. I'm someone in my own practice, I work with, with dead artists, uh, artists that have long passed. Mm. But at the same time, this is a medium that's still alive, as you've shown here beautifully. Um, how, and this is a, quite a big question, but mm -hmm. how do you see your own practice within art history? How do you see this as, is it, is it a next step, or is it something that can also go back and look back in time? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and it's slightly complicated, actually, because, you know, for various reasons, perspectives such as mine were ex obviously traditionally excluded from the canon. So it's very difficult for me to plot my work in a straight line back to the Greco-Roman period. Yeah. <laughs> because obviously so much of work that was made, you know, um, obviously from women and, and from people from a, various, from a certain class and people that were, you know, making work from a mental health issues or whatever, that was always either dismissed or just never facilitated. So that it's always going to be patchy to try and plot some kind of context. Um, but at the same time, I feel as though, you know, I, one of my favourite novels is um, The Leopard, you know, by yeah. Tomasi de Limpedusa, and there's that beautiful line in it um, that something like, if you want things to stay as they are, things are going to have to change. And I feel very much... I feel that attitude very much towards the history of painting in order for us to carry on painting and for the for the canon to evolve we need to invite much more diversity and own that and then ensure the progression of what's happening and I see my I see my work very much as a contribution towards that actually and maybe El Greco is not the best example but if you look back in that long history of art that, that you love delving back into I've been to your studio also. Mm. I've seen many books on the floor and the, the range of your inspiration and influences is, is massive. Mm. If you look back in that big, long history of art, are there certain kindred spirits maybe? Are there specific artists that you can really relate to who you feel might have been trying to do the same thing? I suppose an obvious thing would be to draw out the Italian Renaissance or Dutch Vanitas painting from the 17th century. Um, or there's mogul miniature painting that has taught me so much about the hierarchies of space. Um, but I suppose there are moments in art history, for example, the Ballet Ruse and Diaghilev and 
Um, I love that period of, of what came out of that, like Leon Bast. And yeah. the, but um, I, I actually feel quite comfortable hopping around as well yeah. <laughs> because I, I feel like so much interests me now um, that almost I, I, feel, I feel able to look at something that grabs me and then interrogate that for my own purposes. And as long as it fits conceptually, then I think it's perfectly fine to let that be an influence. And, and do you mind the word influence, by the way? I, just, I know some people mind that word. I think it can be because people say it's appropriation. You do something quite actively. But do you also think that it happens on a different level, maybe? A, a more subconscious way that, that certain artistic traditions seep into your work? Well, that's an interesting one. I mean, I think it's, it's actually the, the job of a contemporary artist to know what they're doing around that. Um, and I feel, yeah, I feel confident in taking that on. I mean, a lot of people feel very nervous about painting because it comes with this huge history, but I just feel huge excitement about that. Yeah. I feel as though I know what I'm doing and I feel like I'm navigating that as part of the challenge. And, and history, it's more than art history, and, and if we're talking about visual art, it's literature as well, of yeah. course. The title of this exhibition uh, is a very clear... Shakespearean reference. Yes. And you've talked a lot about uh, that title and Ophelia and the role of Ophelia and Hamlet. Can you talk about that a little bit more for our audience tonight? What does that mean? Yeah, so the title comes from Hamlet, as you say, um, from a, a soliloquy from Queen Gertrude. And it offers an image, the title, of a contrast. So you've got the willow, which is this huge sweeping tree that can move in either in sort of multifarious directions and then you have the stream or the brook which is this narrow trench and it's only the water's flowing in one way and I like the idea of you know the traditional conception of art history was that it went from the, the Greco-Roman period with the start of western civilization or however we used to get taught in a very linear way that this is how culture evolved and Obviously, lots of voices were excluded from that. Um, and it just felt very rigid and very linear. But even I was, I was taught this way. Um, and I just think now that we've superseded that, thankfully. And it, we sort of see that now the importance of counter-narrative is very, very vital. Um, and so that's where I sort of, in my mind, the image of the brook and the, the sweeping willow um, sort of met. And the, I started thinking about Hamlet, and this painting here is Full Steward, um, which is what Ophelia calls Hamlet, uh, arguably, in the play. And I, I read the play over, over lockdown, during the first lockdown, and it was a revelation, because I didn't realise how erroneous a lot of the characterisation of Ophelia has been. Um, sort of this romanticised female hysteric where actually the language that Shakespeare gives her is really exquisite. And there, there is a reading of that play that she's not mad at all, actually. So at one point, she sort of seems to be giving out flowers to people. And I've seen productions of Hamlet where Ophelia is running across the stage and like throwing handfuls of flowers. But actually, she's handing out columbines to Gertrude and she's calling out her infidelity in front of the court or she's giving fennel to the courtiers, which was, you know, these are things that Shakespeare's audience would have understood. Fennel meant flattery. People understood that language, the language of flowers. So actually, what she was doing was calling out the power base in the court of Denmark. And similarly, some of her speech in the play, she sort of cuts and splices. So she might use a bit of a contemporary maxim or a ditty and then she might put a bit of a bit of a song there and her speech is quite disjointed and that again is why a lot of people have thought well she was just mad but actually if, if language comes from the society which shapes it and your agency is not being recognized by that society then what have you got I mean Noam Chomsky said you know language is all we've got as our tool to connect with people so if if that's something that's that's not, if there's been no room made, she has to choose, she has to take that language and appropriate it and cut it and splice it and make it her own in order to express her own agency. And I just thought that is so interesting. That is what I'm trying to do in painting. And that was when the catalyst for, 
this painting started. And you'll notice on this work, there's a sort of diamond pattern as well in her ensemble. And there's a little harlequin beetle. And these are references to the character of the harlequin in the Commedia dell'arte, who is this character in charge of the narrative. And he it was typically male, um, tapped his stick, literally the slapstick, and could change the scenery and change the narrative. And this work evolved to become, it's not, an, it's not illustri illustrative of Ophelia, but it's very much about a sort of resuscitation of lost agency and a questioning of, you know, who is in charge of the narratives that we receive, you know. It's Ophelia's use of language seems quite freeing, and, and the way you talk about history and, and the history of human creation and how you use these things seems quite, quite free as well. At the same time, when you, uh, your work, when, when critics and, and writers approach it, they often try to tie it down a little bit. They try to cage it a little bit in, in terms of genre. Yeah. A, a word like, um, you know, uh, surrealism is often invoked when they talk about your work, for instance, yeah. which seems to tie it down in ways it might should not be tied down. How do you engage with, with that? Yes, um, I think that's very true. I, I have encountered surrealism as a term. <laughs> and in a sense, you know, I, I have a lot of sympathy for the need to kind of categorize, because how else do you talk about something that is so wide as, pa as painting? Um, you do need some kind of system. So I, I have sympathy for that. And also, you know, I don't, dislike the surrealists. I, I love Max Ernst, for example, yeah. and, you know, I made a Radio 4 documentary about um, Eileen Agar, who also, interestingly, rejected the term surrealist throughout her career. They kept trying to put that on. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the problem. I don't think this work is surreal. Um, so I feel as though there's a plausibility behind all of these scenarios, which doesn't quite fit with the idea of surrealism. And... Also, I feel as though that approach is quite problematic because it's a surrealist movement was a, it was a sort of male movement and they weren't that fond of women. No, it's really. an uncomfortable fit. And sometimes I wonder whether this kind of boxing is the thinking of the old guard, actually, because I think that you can't invite new voices to the table and then sort of apply the old ways of thinking, this very linear, rigid um, Brook-like thinking. <laughs> I think you can't really apply that to work that's coming from a more oblique angle. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that's why I don't like the, that kind of terminology in terms of my practice because I just feel it's artificially reductive. Yeah. Like I don't mind if people think there's surrealistic images. That's fine. But it's just I don't think it. It just doesn't describe the work in its totality. Yeah. It feels lazy. And sometimes I think it feels othering. It's almost dismissive. You know, because it's saying, well, your work is coming from something that is not of the mainstream, or somehow it, it's, yeah, it just feels like it's an othering. And in a way, you say classification has its uses, like a, a biologist would do, and an art historian might attempt as well. At the same time, you introduce these creatures <laughs> into your work. They're often animals or part of biology that defy classification. Can you yes. talk a little bit about that? How do these animals and, and plants function in your work? Yeah, I do. Um, I am increasingly fascinated by, by the natural world, actually, and by the ingenuity of the natural world. And we were chatting earlier about just different, incredible different instances in nature in terms of evolution when um, perhaps certain species seem to have developed characteristics that aren't related to their survival. It just feels very eccentric somehow. And I always feel as though we as humans are missing a lot of information in terms of how the universe functions. And I feel as though when I encounter this, I don't really have the language to describe what I mean, but this almost uncanny note, it's almost as though the natural world... I think you do have the language and it's, it's here on the walls. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for that. I'm glad that that's um, legible in that way. But um, I sort of feel as though the natural kingdoms sometimes point to something else that's on the edge of our perception, but we can't quite get there. But it's almost assigning to something other, which is really thrilling, actually. Yeah. But together with these very unusual creatures, these very mysterious creatures, 
there's also the very everyday open. There are objects in these pictures that appear, objects you also collect and that you have in your studio. How do these objects relate to the more mysterious biological creatures we've seen? And how do these objects enter your paintings? Can you tell a bit more about that? Yeah, that is a really good question, actually. Um, I really like the poetry of Wiesfarver. Yeah. She's Polish. Sorry, I'm really sorry about my pronunciation. Szymborska. She won the Nobel Prize, and she's an incredible poet. And what I love about her work is that she might pick up a fragment of human experience, and it might just be something like sunlight slanting through a room, but she's able, in her incredible poetry, to somehow expound about the nature of the human condition from this very small thing. And I find that absolutely fascinating. So with some of the objects, they're never chosen, they're never arbitrary, and there's never any symbolism. They're always chosen because they have some, quant they have some quality that is important in terms of signification in, in the practice. And um, sometimes it might be just to add a note of humor, just to earth the work. Um, so sometimes they might be, I mean, the, the paintings are very much of this moment in time, actually. I think it's really important as a contemporary artist to be of your time, and sometimes it's about, about that, actually. Um, also, you know, I feel as though we live in such a fetishistic culture when it comes to objects. And um, it's interesting to me when I go to a museum, for example, I remember Neil McGregor, I think it was, that was talking about when you encounter an object in a museum, typically if it's something that's been from years ago or a culture that you don't know very much about, you have to make an imaginative leap as a human <laughs> to try and get your head around this thing. And that can be quite alienating, I think, because you can, not un you can see the limits of your own perception, the limits yeah. of your own knowledge. So then the display of those objects becomes, in your quest for knowledge, it becomes a sort of heightening of your own understanding of your own ignorance. So I think that's an also quite an interesting, slightly alienating aspect of looking at objects as well. I was thinking a bit more about the relationship between, let's say, the mysterious... Uh, insect and, <laughs> and the, the little fragment of lipstick that you both find in your paintings. They could both be considered marginal and not in a negative sense, but some things that exist in the margins that are sometimes overlooked. Uh, have you thought about that notion of marginality? What does that mean to you? Yeah, I think that's such a sensitive question and I think it's a really important one actually. Um, a lot of the time you'll see that some of the objects in the paintings are barely there. And Joost and I were looking at, there's a painting um, in the first gallery, there's a tiny sh fragment, a shard of a skin that's been shredded by a snake. Or there is sort of a bruised grass or um, a smoking candle wick or something that, phenomena that is barely there and that's so easily overlooked. And there is this sense of sort of ushering in to center stage and a valuing of fragile states um, and perhaps things that have been overlooked. Um, an example of this might be there's a painting in this room actually at the back um, of, with the figure with the hair. And there's a fretwork there that we were talking about earlier, which was actually a print from Vivian Westwood, an Anglomania print. But the fretwork, which is that sort of shape, that typically found um, classically as decoration on the borders. But Vivian Westwood bought it for center stage. It became the print itself. And that's deliberately cited there, exactly as you're talking about. It's something that is um, quite an important aspect of the work, actually. So thank you for bringing that out. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, talking about you, your work, I realize that, that it, it's very conceptual in a way. There, there's a lot of concept that underlies something that someone might encounter as purely visual in the first instance. Earlier today, when we were in the gallery, a, a group of four children approached you, um, and they were alerted by one of the security guards that you were, in fact, the artist that made these pictures they came to see. And they asked you very much about very technical things. How do you paint that hair? How do you paint that background? So between something very immediate like that and the very conceptual things we've been discussing. 
how do you how do you see your paintings? Can they exist at multiple levels at the same time? You think? Yeah, they really can. I think that's it's such a joy to talk to you about this, Yost, because I really feel like you know your approach to painting is so similar to my own, actually. Yes. I can't paint, by the way. <laughs> but you have your knowledge banks are extraordinary, and um, yeah, you don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I do see my work as conceptual art, but I don't think that conceptual art has to then lose a visual lusciousness. I think you can have both. Yeah. Um, yes, it's really important to me that the work is visually seductive because I think, you know, again, people are so used to just seeing images scrolling past in order to keep people's attention from a very quick casual encounter and try and draw people in. That, that also has a function. It's, it's a device in a sense. Um, but, yeah, I do see the work as, as conceptual. That I think you can, you're free to, 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 it's, you're free to enter at any point. You can, you can, if you're not feeling like the deep dive that day, you can experience a painting on, on one level, but if you are keen to find, to mind for the content and, you, and you're in that presence of mind, or you're, you know, somebody like myself, or you guys that really enjoy looking at painting, then there's content there for you to find. You can encounter it on either both, preferably. But, you know, something really interesting happened to me. This exactly a year ago, I had to go for a meeting in Florence, and I'd been stuck in my attic painting because I couldn't get to the studio during all the lockdowns. And I'd literally just not left my house for about six months. And then I was suddenly in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, and I was seeing paintings that I'm familiar with and know, I thought I knew, inside out for like 20 years. And I think it was just that, the, the sort of stark relief, relief of sort of going from one state of sort of lockdown in my domestic situation and then suddenly being in the cradle of, you know, the Italian Renaissance and seeing these paintings again. And I experienced a, a completely different painting, like some of these incredible, familiar, famous masterpieces. But I was seeing them completely differently. And it made me realize that it had probably been a few years since I'd been there and I had accumulated different life experiences, nothing to do with an academic approach. It was what I was bringing to the work had, had changed. And I just thought, okay, that is the hallmark of incredible painting. If you can experience a painting in many different ways, it always reveals something different to you. I think that's when, you know, for me, this is not about traps of sort of, sorry, pieces of colored dirt trapped in layers of resin. It's not about that. It's about what happens when the viewer looks at this and what they bring to the work. That's where the work of art, that's when it happens. That's the work of art. That's why it's conceptual in that sense. The currency is ideas and not, it's not about technique or, or the actual um, execution of the paint. Um, so yeah, I just think that's, that's why I love painting so much because it can facilitate all of that. Yeah, we, we, a painting we looked at together, and again, one made in the Italian Renaissance, was Bronzino's Allegory in the National Gallery in London. I don't know if you know this picture, but it's one of those eternal mysteries. Entire libraries have been written about interpretations of this work. But we were talking about this painting earlier, and you said, maybe it should never give away all of its secrets. Maybe it's an eternal riddle, and therefore it is worthwhile. And there are days you can come look at the way Bronzino paints blue so beautifully. Oh, and there are days where you can come to look at this painting and think about the allegories he's playing with, the, the, the subtle linguistic riddles. And there's, there's always more to give. And maybe that's how your work functions as well. I just think that is a really beautiful concept, really, because we're so used to just everything being consumable and gettable. And there's something about human nature that wants to somehow systematize and, and quantify so that we can control. And I think that is artificial, perhaps. Um, I'm quite fascinated by um, the world of haute couture. And um, I sometimes think about a conversation that I, I read about in the newspaper about Ray Kouakubo, you know, from Comme des Garçons. And she was asked about whether her creations could be seen as like a koan that, that Buddhist idea of, you know, the, the point is the journey that you go on. 
I don't think that is the case in my work, but there's definitely something about that, for sure. And that's why I employ such visual chicanery to slow the viewer down. It's, this work, you know, is made in response to the work that came before it, which was, you know, collected by an advertising guru, which was very much about, you know, some of it was quite one note, not all of it, some of it's masterpiece. But um, I think this is the antithesis of that. And I think we are, we can tend to be quite uncomfortable with that. Um, I'm currently really influenced in, in the studio I'm reading about dialetheism, which is the idea that, you know, something can be true and not true simultaneously. And what's so fascinating to me as somebody that is interrogating the history of art in my own work is that um, there's some very interesting philosophy that is currently being written. Um, Suki Finn's written amazingly on this from actually from a lot of female philosophers um, that are really pushing this idea of dialetheism and it's really gaining ground. And what's so fascinating about that is then it pulls the rug from underneath the whole of logic. And that is what, <laughs> you know, European thought has based on. <laughs> so I feel as though it's such an exciting moment to be a practitioner now because we're at this moment where we can really interrogate and redefine. And I just think that has a really useful function in being progressive and in moving things on. And I hope you keep pulling on that rug for the rest of your life as you're doing in your practice. It's always a joy to talk about painting with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.